Okay, it is noon here in Colorado. Thank you so much for joining us. And welcome to our ninth and the last 2021 lecture for the Enhancing Wellness for Healthcare Professionals through Engagement with the Arts Lecture Series. My name is Kristen Torres. I'm a professional research assistant here on the CU Anschutz Medical Campus. And I'm also the project manager of the CORAL team. For those of you who don't know what CORAL is, CORAL is the Colorado Resiliency Arts Lab. We're hosting this lecture with the help of the National Endowments of the Arts, which is our study sponsor. What we're trying to do is really bridge the relationship between healthcare and arts to enhance and inspire those relationships to grow. So today we're welcoming our own team. And with me today, I have our principal investigator, Dr. Mark Moss, who is our Roger S. Mitchell, professor of medicine and the head of the division of pulmonary science and critical care medicine at University of Colorado School of Medicine, as well as our co-investigators, Catherine Reed, who is an art therapist and a manager of the Ponzio Creative Arts Program at Children's Hospital Colorado, Michael Henry, who is the co-founder and executive director of the Lighthouse Writers Workshop, which is one of the largest independent literary centers in the country, Hilary Sin, who is a dance and movement therapist at the Ponzio Creative Arts Program at Children's Hospital Colorado, Tony Edelblut, who is a music therapist at the Ponzio Creative Arts Program at Children's Hospital Colorado. So today they're going to be speaking on the collateral threads in the Resiliency Research Lab with a focus on the data collected and how the creative processes help to mitigate the burnout in healthcare professionals. And as a reminder, as you listen, if you have any questions, feel free to use the Q&A section of the Zoom chat. We're gonna go through those in a Q&A towards the end of the lecture. So be sure to put any questions you have in there. And from there, I will turn it over to Dr. Moss. Kristen, thanks so much. I'm gonna share my screen and let me, oops, I did the wrong one. Can you see the slides, Kristen? Yes, yeah, that looks good, Mark. Great, okay. Um, well, I wanna <clears throat> thank uh, everyone for inviting our group to present. Um, we're very excited about this. We've been working on this project for well over two to three years. And I think we have some interesting information to present. Um, as Kristen said, this is a collaboration between researchers at the University of Colorado, the Ponzio Creative Arts Therapy Program, the Lighthouse, Writers Workshop, and it's supported by the National Endowment of the Arts. And we were recently renewed to continue our studies. So I just wanna bring up the point that we've always had difficult jobs in healthcare. Um, we've always dealt with death and dying, um, but, but things seem to have changed and this is before the pandemic. Um, and when we think about what's changed in healthcare that's added additional stress onto healthcare professionals. There's less autonomy in our work and increased um, focus on documentation. And as I said, we didn't go to medical school or nursing school or other healthcare professional schools, respiratory therapy or others to sit in front of a computer and write notes. Um, it's not what we thought we were signing up to do. There's increased focus on quality measures and cost issues. I think patients are sicker. There's more chronic disease and critical illness. Families and patients have higher expectations. And what's surprising and concerning is that there's decreased patient trust um, in the healthcare professional. There are surveys that are performed across the United States. And back in 1966, 73% of our country had great confidence in the medical profession. And in 2012, it had dropped all the way down to 34%. And as we know, that's before the current COVID pandemic, and I would not be surprised if it's dropped even further. And there's also additional stress in academic medical centers. There was decreased NIH funding, which added stress to PhDs and other healthcare professionals, in addition to doctors or physician scientists. And the whole residency hour work issue limitations, um, the work didn't go away, it just got shifted to other people from residents to attendings and other healthcare professionals such as APPs. So we talked a lot about burnout and I think it's a okay term to be honest. Um, I think um, it, there are deeper seated issues um, that burnout leads to. But when we think about what burnout is, it's really a discrepancy between what we thought the job description was and what it actually is. 
So you thought you were taking a job that had certain qualities and characteristics, but you get into it and you realize it's not what you're doing and it's not what you thought you were studying to do. Um, and, and that's not just in healthcare, that's in, in any profession. It's also important to realize that burnout is a work-related problem. People don't start a job with symptoms of burnout. They occur gradually over time. And the way I think about that is that for those of us that wear glasses or contacts, when you first went to the eye doctor and put your glasses on, you're like, wow, I didn't realize I could see that well because you had gradually lost your vision over time. Um, and then when it's fixed, you don't realize how far removed from where you started from was. But the people around you recognize it. They realize that something's changed in your behavior. And the other thing is that burnout happens in the most in idealist, idealistic employees. They're not people that had a prior psych history. And they're really the ones that went into healthcare because they wanted to help people and they wanted to, um, that they care exactly the people that you would want caring for you or your loved ones. More specifically, there are three components of, of burnout. The first is emotional exhaustion. This isn't just being tired. This is feeling that you're devoting excessive time and efforts to something that's not beneficial. And that could be, for example, um, taking care of a patient uh, who you think is going to pass away no matter what you do, but you have to continue to care for that patient. Depersonalization is the second component of burnout. And this is where we put a distance between ourselves and our patients or our families and dismiss that they have human qualities. And you'll notice this, that it, when a patient passes away, maybe you don't even express any empathy or grief, you move on to the next patient that you have to care for. I actually think this is what anatomy lab was all about. Um, I don't think it was about learning the 23 muscles of the forearm. I think it was teaching us to depersonalize. And I think it's an okay coping mechanism, but I, I don't think it's the ideal one. And if you're exhausted and depersonalized, then you start to question whether you um, have personal accomplishment in your job. Um, you start to feel that maybe you're not good enough, a little bit of an imposter syndrome, feel ineffective in what you're doing. Um, and those three things uh, uh, define what burnout is. Now we're a resiliency group. So what is resiliency? And it's really the ability to bounce back from a difficult time um, and recover in a um, effective way. I think about this as a spider web. Spider webs um, give, and then they bounce back to where they were before. Resiliency has been talked about a lot. I think, again, it's an overused term. Um, people talk about whether it's a state or a trait. Is it something you can learn to do? I think like anything, like a, we'll say athletic ability or musical ability, there's some people that are naturally more resilient. They're naturally people that are better athletes, but you can learn to be more resilient. You can, in the same way, if you take tennis lessons, um, you can become a better tennis player. In the same way, if you, you learn skills to become more resilient, people can improve their ability to be resilient. So at, with the support of the National Endowment of the Arts, we uh, created this creative arts um, therapy group. Um, and to give you a little bit of an introduction of what we mean by creative arts therapy is that we don't always have the ability to really express what we're feeling verbally. And therefore, if we give individuals another medium to express themselves, whether that's through art, music, movement, or writing, they're able to get their expressions out and, and share them either with themselves or other people. And creative arts therapy is a little bit different than just art and putting someone in a room and giving them a pencil and paper and getting them to draw or an instrument and learn to play music. Um, it's guided and supported by a creative arts therapist um, who helps the individual and the group identify, explore, and process feelings through this creative process. So it is a little bit of a group therapy session. And this was a paper that our group wrote that was led by Catherine. Uh, people want to learn more about creative arts therapy and what the possibilities are. <clears throat> so we hypothesized that an integrated creative arts therapy program could build resiliency, reduce burnout, and ultimately enhance patient care. And we had two aims for the first um, uh, funding from the National Endowment of the Arts. 
Um, first, we had to create these creative arts therapy programs, and we did that over the course of a few months in an iterative process, getting input from creative arts therapy experts from around the country, and we developed protocols for our different modalities. And then the second part was to develop or determine the utility and feasibility of creative arts therapy, therapy programs to build resiliency among critical care healthcare professionals. We were initially focused on the ICU because it's where I and others work. And right when we were about to start the study, um, the pandemic hit and shut down the study before we even started. It was one of my uh, moments of uh, thinking I knew what was going on and didn't. I was telling Catherine, I'm like, oh, we'll be fine. I don't think the pandemic will, will shut things down. And three days later, the state got shut down. Um, and that was an opportunity to, to think about who we should include in the study. And due to the pandemic, we expanded the criteria to include all healthcare professionals because we realized that due to the pandemic and even beforehand, um, all healthcare professionals were experiencing stress in their jobs. So we were able to start the study back up again um, or started in September of 2020. And the inclusion criteria were healthcare professionals um, who worked at least 20 hours had signs and symptoms of decreased resiliency, which was based on a scoring system, and also had positive signs of burnout based on um, uh, scoring positively on the MASH-LAC burnout inventory. And the only exclusion criteria was that people weren't willing to participate in any of the four interventions, so that it was very generalizable. And we ended up enrolling or planned to enroll 150 healthcare professionals. These were enrolled into three sequential study cohorts. So each cohort had about 50 people in them. If you do the math, three cohorts, 150 people, four interventions and one control group, there are about 30 people in each of the groups. And we studied, we had participants complete pre and post surveys before and after the intervention started. Um, and we were looking at differences between the two. So I'm gonna turn it over to Catherine, who is gonna tell us a little bit more about the, how the study was uh, designed. Mark, thanks so much. And uh, I really appreciate being here. My name is Catherine Reed. I'm an art therapist here at Children's Hospital Colorado. And really what I'm gonna talk about is the way we designed the interventions themselves. So Mark just mentioned there were about 30. It was actually more about um, 15 people per group. And we had these four arms. So I facilitated the art therapy group and um, Hillary will be speaking with us as well, um, presented the dance movement. We had our music therapist, uh, Tonia Edelblut do the music. And then we also partnered with Lighthouse Writers Workshop which is a really important partnership to, to discuss. So we're three entities. We are Children's Hospital Colorado's Creative Arts Therapy Program, the University of Colorado with Mark and his research team, including Kristen, and then Lighthouse Writers Workshop. So we're really an amalgamation of creative arts therapists and artists in the community. Um, so Mike Henry will be talking about how we came together. Um, he as a writer and the, the leader of a really um, independent creative writing program that is nationally renowned. So we divided the 12 week workshops into three phases and they're, they're described here pretty clearly. The, the first four weeks are really important for us to really create a sense of safety and space so that our participants realize that they're not at work, first of all, they have a chance to decompress um, and explore their identities as healthcare providers, but also beyond that. What else do they describe themselves as beyond healthcare providers? And eventually we're hoping to kind of return to that initial draw to the, to the profession that they found. Um, the second phase is really getting into the um, vicarious trauma that may have been experienced by the participants or witnessed. Um, and then really getting into those, using the arts, exploring it with music, art, writing, and dance, which means exploring it with the body. Um, and Hillary will talk more about that. The last four weeks are really where we move beyond the individual experience and their individual expressions into a group um, expression. So in each of the four areas, we moved 
um, into the idea of a community and how are we viewing ourselves as part of a community, whether at our hospital where we work, um, in our homes, how those two interact, and then how do we bring these expressions we've created into those worlds? All right, next slide. And we also had a control group, which is not on that, but the control group is what helped us really create um, our evidence base. So our outcome variables were based on primarily feasibility um, and attendance, which was remarkably high, um, especially with Mark, Dr. Moss has about 15 years experience doing resilience um, workshops and different studies. And he's reported that this has been some of the best attendance he's seen. So that's great to hear. Acceptability as well, measured with a um, client satisfaction questionnaire. And then finally, uh, we did pre and post psychological distress score surveys. So all of these were um, essential to our creating the evidence base that um, gave us some pretty incredible data we'll talk about later. All right, next slide. So I'm gonna talk briefly about art therapy and then we're gonna show you a quick video. So you can really get a feel for what it was like for our participants. So first of all, it's really important to know that art therapy is a mental health profession and human services profession. Art therapists work in all kinds of places, um, in hospitals, beyond hospitals, in all kinds of um, community centers and uh, places where people gather. And also some, some art therapists work independently in private practice. So we are artists who use psychodynamic processes and theory um, to really support the healing of individuals and groups. So our program does this for patients and families here at Children's Hospital and has for the 17 years we've been a program. But what's new and exciting about this research is that we're really able to work with our team members and our staff to explore and study the effects of our methods and interventions on the concept of resilience. And uh, we do that in groups. And so we're looking at the primary factors um, that Mark and his studies and several other resilience studies have really identified as being the primary factors when resilience is low, which are feelings of isolation, um, stress, anxiety, PTSD symptoms, and burnout symptoms. So we're really looking to reduce those feelings of isolation to build relationships within our workshops and then also to look at communication. How do we talk about what is hard as healthcare professionals? Um, how do we process it? How do we manage it and compartmentalize it so that we can keep moving day to day? So as you can see, I, I uh, have some images here on the screen. The three books that you see, each with a different title, are the three products that were created by the first three cohorts of our study. The first called Vulnerability, the second called Under the Mask, and the third called The Roles We Play. These titles were created by the group. And so the group chose the theme of the book and then chose a piece of artwork from each individual um, that really represented that theme. And so these products are actually on our website and you can peruse them yourself. But I believe first today, we are going to show you a video um, just to give you a flavor of what this is like. It's about a three minute video. So thanks, Mark, for queuing that up. I'm gonna die. Hi, I'm Stephanie and I am a certified child life specialist. The thing I love most about my job is the fact that this is really the perfect blend of what I wanted. I wanted to be in healthcare, but I didn't have to do those invasive procedures and I could help children understand their experience and really master it. But my job is really hard. I have had to explain to kids when they're going to die and that's not easy. I'm Catherine, and I am an art therapist. It's taxing emotionally on our healthcare professionals to be there every day for these kids when your heart is breaking. And what do we do with the pain, with the trauma, with the sadness? And what we've found is that 
bringing creative arts therapy into the room, there is a natural healing element that is a wonderful thing. As a child life specialist, I use play as a way to educate children, to help them feel that this environment that they're in, the hospital, the clinical setting is normal. And I think art really translates that for healthcare professionals because sometimes it can be really hard to verbalize the frustration or the sadness or the grief that you're feeling. Having that task that everyone is doing puts us all in this normal, calm space, and then we can reflect on what we've done and go even deeper, and I think that's where that therapeutic level comes in. It's the combination of that facilitator and the group discussion. What is happening across the country is that healthcare professionals are getting exhausted. We are often asked to do more than what is emotionally healthy for us. We don't really expect our healthcare professionals to admit that they are sad or to admit that they are tired even. Coral is a potential answer to that problem. To have a place where those truths can come out and can be explored and processed and then shared with other people, I think is an incredible way to build community. This program has helped me understand that I am a strong person and I do have skills and I am capable of being a really great child life specialist, but sometimes the scenarios that I go through are just really hard. Having that resource available to team members, to staff, to employees is just invaluable. All right, Mark, thank you so much for that. Um, we actually have a video for each of our modalities, but I'm gonna pass the mic, so to speak, to our dance movement therapist, Hilary Sin. Thank you so much. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you everybody on the team and also to all the participants. I really appreciate your, your presence and being curious and interested in, in this work. Um, my name is Hilary Sin. I'm a dance movement therapist here at Children's Hospital Colorado. I work primarily in the psych departments, um, working with children and teenagers. And then on this project, I was fortunate enough to work with healthcare workers, um, meaning adults. And so that was an interesting shift to be bringing dance movement therapy to uh, professional adults. Um, I think there might be an assumption that dance and movement are maybe more readily accessible to children um, due to their openness and this, this nonverbal world that they inhabit. And it's equally important for uh, adults to remember and maintain um, a, a vibrant physical life that isn't purely about work and, and function, but is also about expression and relationship and joy and pleasure. So dance movement therapy is the psychotherapeutic use of movement to promote emotional, social, cognitive, and physical integration of the individual. This is what the American Dance Therapy Association um, uses as, as their definition of dance movement therapy. Dance movement therapy can do um, many things, but um, for the purposes of this presentation, it can improve the body-mind connection, mediate stress and trauma held in the body, bring awareness to suppressed emotions. And the video we're gonna watch, um, one of the participants in the dance movement therapy group speaks to this um, specifically about discovering uh, feelings and thoughts and emotions that she didn't realize that she had um, around a certain issue that she had experienced at work. And she discovered that through her body in motion while in community. It can also break through social isolation and support meaningful connection and very simply, it can elevate mood, which I'm sure is something most people have experienced, having any kind of movement experience, whether it's exercise or, or dancing, and maybe feeling just a bit more um, optimistic and hopeful afterwards. So with that, I think we can go to the video. Thanks, Mark. Hi, I'm Melissa. 
I'm a clinical social worker on an adult inpatient psychiatry unit. Burnout is hard to articulate. For me, it looked like feeling unmotivated at my job, feeling like I wasn't making an impact or I wasn't doing my job well. I was just feeling really exhausted. I'm Hilary Sin, and I'm a dance movement therapist at Children's Hospital Colorado. I'm very used to people becoming immediately tense and maybe slightly frightened when they find out they're in the presence of a dance movement therapist, because it's a very vulnerable thing to think about moving your body creatively rather than functionally. Moving your body attached with identifying what you've been experiencing was something I, I wasn't maybe ready or prepared for. I quickly became more comfortable because we did an exercise that first session and everybody identified that they were nervous or feeling scared. If you're willing to let yourself be vulnerable, then you open yourself up to greater possibility for connection. There tends to be a focus on the body as being purely functional. I personally think it's important for healthcare workers to remember that the body is also a place of expression and joy and pleasure and play. I think that this experience has taught me that we hold things in parts of our body that we aren't even aware of. There are somatic experiences that don't often get released. There's so much intensity that happens within the walls of a hospital. It's vitally important to be able to integrate all those experiences so you can sequence and express all of those big feelings that often have to be compartmentalized. This has been a need for a long time. People who work in healthcare are tired. If we want to call that burnout, we want to call it exhausted, whatever it may be, they need to be taken care of. The wellness of nurses, doctors, social workers, mental health workers, it absolutely feeds into the cycle of the overall health of the community. I feel like I have more motivation to round in the morning and to meet with patients and to have difficult conversations with them. If I don't know how to process or if I don't have the words to talk about how difficult a day was, I now have an outlet that could help. And I could find a quiet space, put on a song and just let my body do the talking. Great, thank you. Um, I feel so fortunate that we have these videos. It's good to see these every, every time I see something different. So I want to say one more thing before we move to music therapy and that's in dance movement therapy, there is no artifact or product. So the, the creation is of that moment. And I think that really speaks to the power of that particular modality. And now I'm going to hand it over to Tony Edelblut our music therapist. All right, thank you very much, Hillary. Um, <clears throat> so yes, my name is Tony Edelblut. I'm a music therapist at Children's Hospital Colorado. Same program as Hillary and Catherine. Uh, and I've been a music therapist there since 2003. Um, I was uh, also a great pleasure for me to be part of this team as I've been uh, most of my work uh, at Children's has focused mostly on teenagers and families. And I will share maybe as an added dimension here that I have found that my work with teenagers actually, you know, I mean, it makes sense developmentally, but it uh, very much prepares a therapist to work with adults as well. Um, a lot of the issues that we're working through as teens are continue to be things that we work through as adults. And I was feeling pretty confident that the interventions that I made part of this program uh, would be uh, as effective with adults as they had been with the teens and the families that I had uh, designed a lot of them for. Um, so I won't try to assess that because that's why we're doing research, but I just did want to say that in terms of how, um, how I was thinking about this curriculum as, we, as I adapted it for music specifically. So uh, for those of you who have not heard about music therapy uh, in the past, or uh, are only a little bit familiar. So um, it is an established profession, established about uh, a little bit after uh, World War II uh, because the music volunteers were being very effective in ways that a lot with uh, what they were calling shell shock back then, that uh, a lot of the other healthcare professionals were not being effective. And that was sort of the roots of uh, music becoming a profession in the United States. Uh, and in a sense, uh, grown uh, past that, 
uh, use for what we now are now calling uh, PTSD uh, to include lots of other things. Pretty much every, uh, I, I know that my training, I specialize, uh, I'm both a, a, a licensed professional counselor and a music therapist. So I think about these things very psychologically. Um, so, and we can use music for, uh, I've found with, uh, in different ways with most every presentation that we might have with a client. So we uh, do create goals within a therapeutic relationship. Uh, we are credentialed professionals and uh, we do study this. We're not just a bunch of uh, musicians with uh, good intentions who can sing a bunch of songs. Although there, uh, there's also a great use for that. Uh, I just think that uh, we work very hard to define sort of the context in which uh, it's the most meaningful. Um, Mark, I don't know what's going on. I I'm seeing a, a black uh, square in the middle of your screen there. Okay, so I was, I was answering that part of the chat, so sorry. Oh, okay, cool. Um, so I think the second point though is uh, whenever I talk to people about music therapy, I think it's, I mean, I think it's true to, to a great degree of all the creative arts therapies, uh, but uh, with music, it's particularly uh, easy to notice that when we make music, uh, is there's not, there's not just one spot in our brain that lights up when we make music, that the making of music is actually this very, uh, neurologically collaborative event between a lot of systems within your within your brain you know and, and I always use the example just we're all familiar with turning on the radio and hearing a song but if you start thinking about how many different cognitive processes go back go into uh, singing a song for three and a half minutes um, there's, there's quite a bit going on uh, everything from verbal centers to physical coordination to uh, registering emotional responses and communicating those emotional responses through the voice um, you know, not to mention all the autonomic things that are happening. So it's just, uh, when we're, whenever we talk about making music, and I'll, I'll come back to this a little bit when I talk about the song uh, that we wrote, is that we're never just talking about doing one thing. We're talking about there's a lot of things going on even within a person's experience, and how do we make those things line up together? Uh, and so I, I like to talk about it like that because sometimes we don't think of music. We just think of music as the pretty sounds, but really what the music is, is music is a way of, of, of putting together a whole bunch of things that are happening all at the same time and making that move sensibly through time, uh, which is, I always tell people, is exactly what a song is. It's, we're going to move sensibly and in an ordered and descriptive way through time for the next however many minutes. So... Um, so that's kind of what that's, you know, for me, that's kind of the rationale of what is, is going on therapeutically. So in that process, it can evoke explicit uh, memories and images and the feelings that go along with them, right? So if you think of a favorite song from like when you were in high school or in college or with a particular group of friends, uh, hearing that song doesn't just make you feel that way. It, it gives you all the explicit memories and um, even people will talk about, like, I remember how I felt in my body just hearing that song. Because I remember that time of my life when I was hanging out with these people and I can remember everything about it when I, just when I hear that song. So uh, it acts as a trigger for, again, very complex uh, memories and recall and uh, offers a lot of opportunities to, for discussion and integration. So, uh, so then doing that with a group of people, you know, I'm, I'm making it sound terribly complex, but when you do that with a group of people, uh, and you make that process work with a group of people, uh, it tends to, uh, it tends to feel good, you know, uh, reduces stress, it regulates moods, and it can build up relationship skills, right, because I have to both listen to what I'm doing and listen to what's happening in the room around me, um, and, and that kind of even though we kind of naturally do that when we talk, uh, music really isolates that particular aspect of both listening uh, to my to my own uh, interior process and also attending to what's going on in the environment around me. So uh, there's a lot of opportunities to practice and to raise and regulate moods. Cool. And I think for mine, we're just going to go on to the song itself, right? Cool. Um, maybe, okay, uh, before you hit play, cool, don't hit play yet. Okay. Uh, bam, there it is. Okay, uh, we're going to be listening to Empty Cup. There are three songs on there you'll see because we did three cohorts. Uh, what I will say about this is um, Catherine presented earlier about the various stages and then that last stage where it was really community building and using the microcosm of the group to uh, have a community experience. Um, I, for myself, I chose songwriting just because that's a focal interest for me. Um, we, uh, we haven't talked too much, but there is a hope that we will uh, 
be able to kind of share these curricula with with people that I can maybe train other music therapists. And I will just say that I don't necessarily think that it has to be songwriting. It's just, that's what I like a lot. And as the leader of, the, of this little mini community, that's what I brought. Other music therapists might be more uh, teaching focused. They might, um, they might just have other kind of musical focuses that uh, would suit themselves, but I chose songs. Anyway, so uh, this uh, song, Empty Cup, came from our second cohort. Uh, and again, I said before that uh, music is really about lining up a lot of things all at the same time, and that ends up being a very satisfying thing when that comes together. So the things we were lining up in order to write this song is I had the uh, group do a bunch of lyric brainstorming. I've got some processes for that. And the title itself came from one of the group members who just used this, uh, which a uh, metaphor you all have probably heard, that you just you can't pour from an empty cup. You know, I can't keep giving at my job if I got nothing to give. So uh, she was using this uh, metaphor quite a bit and it got to be the most um, repeated little refrain. So uh, true to musical song forms, a refrain is a chorus. So I made that the, I made that the hook basically of the song, this idea of an empty cup. And then uh, this particular cohort just sort of uh, gave me all the lyrical ideas and uh, wasn't really up for a lot of the musical decision-making. So they let me, kind of come back to them next week uh, and try to, uh, and so what I tried to do is pack as many of the points that they had made into a single song. So we're going to listen to that. Um, oh, and the other thing I will say about that, the other layers we were lining up is I wanted them to be able to perform it with me. So you'll hear a little uh, thing at the beginning, you and me equally. Um, that was for the group members to sing while I played piano. Other group members played drums as the rhythm. Uh, what you're hearing is just my uh, studio rendition of it. So I don't have, a, I don't, we're not listening to the live recording of the, of the group singing. It's just my rendition of it. Uh, but in terms of live uh, performance, I'm playing guitar. Half the bunch of the group is playing drums and then everybody who's willing to sing is singing the little backup part that I wrote. So that was the other thing I was trying to line up is like, I'm gonna play a song, but it's gonna be their ideas and they're gonna be able to participate in it. And yet I want it to be an interesting song that non-trained musicians can play. So there's your setup and we'll listen to the song now. Here comes another message. So much news that I'm dreading. I stop to breathe for a second. Why do I jump to conclusions? I'm not sure I would use them. I'm not sure what the truth is. Wisdom grant me a new grace to walk about my own space and know which way is up. I do my best for me and you equally can't pour from an empty cup. You can't drink from an empty cup. Sufficient. So many times when I did it, balance taking and giving. You can't blame me if I'm shaking. All the shifts I have taken, still my joy is awake now. Or will I stay silent? No. Doesn't matter what they think. No. Will I hold it all in? No. Will I give till I break? What? No. Will I stay silent? No. Doesn't matter what they think. No. Will I hold it all in? No. Will I give till I break? What? No. Wisdom grant me the grace to occupy my own space and know which way is up. I do my best for me and you equally can pour from an empty cup. You can't drink from an empty cup. You can't share an empty cup. You can't pour from an empty cup. I see my heart. I see the world. I see something. Encore. <laughs> Bird. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you, guys. So I'm going to pass it over to uh, to Michael Henry now, who is the uh, 
founder of Lighthouse Writers Workshop, and he's going to tell us about the writing cohort. So take it away, Michael. Thank you, Tony. Um, every time I hear that song, I just I, I just love it. It's so good. It's so funky, and <laughs> it's just great. So thank you for that. Um, hi, I'm Mike Henry. I'm the executive director at Lighthouse Writers Workshop. Um, I am not a trained therapist. I have a master's degree in creative writing. Um, I have extensive experience teaching creative writing in particular poetry and nonfiction. Um, and so, you know, I come from the arts, from the arts community, which um, lends a different perspective um, to, to this work. But I will say that working with Hillary and Catherine and Tony and Mark has been an, an absolutely amazing experience. Um, I've learned so much about sort of therapeutic strategies also about research. Now I know what a control group is. It's all very exciting. Um, and what I would say in terms of what the, what the creative writing cohort uh, experience was like for me, um, leading it, teaching it, um, was that, the, you know, we've been doing at Lighthouse, we've been doing this kind of work with, for um, lack of a better um, descriptor, at-risk communities for a long time now. And what we've known anecdotally is how uh, when you engage with individuals to, um, in creative writing to allow them to put their stories, their thoughts, their hopes and dreams on the page, um, that's an incredibly re powerful and redemptive act. Um, and that's really sort of the foundation of what we do. What we understand and what I've, un I've understood for a while in these kinds of workshops is how if someone has had a life experience that, have, that has in some ways um, dismantled or broken apart their sense of self, their sense of their purpose and really their sense of you know how how the world works if they are able to take that experience and write about it in effect taking that experience and putting it down on the page encompassing that experience in story in language um, they gain control and power over that story would which, which previously had control over them and it's a really um, kind of a, a, a powerful way of, of thinking about it. So um, like has been said before, you know, the first few sessions in the creative writing uh, workshop is about just getting people used to the act of writing, um, getting them comfortable. Um, we talk about the concept of free writing, which is the only goal that you have is to write for a set period of time, usually 10 to 25 minutes. The only goal is to keep the pen or pencil moving across the page. Um, what you write doesn't have to be good. It doesn't have to make sense. It doesn't have to rhyme if it's a poem. It could be terrible. So we try to lower those barriers um, so that people can really tap into the creative flow and end up writing the stories that they need to, to, to talk about. Um, and it's a really fun process. And I would also say, and I think the other um, instructors would concur with this idea is, um, there's, it's really interesting to see people um, creatively involve themselves, to, to be creatively involved, but the sense of connection and community that's been built in these um, small groups, these kinds of sacred spaces has been um, incredibly rewarding um, and comforting to see. So I just want to read to you a short poem, which was written by um, Katie, who is a, a nurse, and she was in our second cohort, and it's called Stay in the Moment. And the first line, what I sometimes do is I randomly choose a line of poetry for them to use as a prompt. And so the first line of this poem is the random prompt. Gravity of heart and mind isn't very sunny. It's smooth and heavy, a mysterious stone you lugged home from the river. It's news that your sister has two DUIs, an arrest warrant, and slept in her car during the worst blizzard Washington state has seen in five years. Gravity of heart and mind is love and pain fitted together tightly, like the joints of a cabin built by Mennonites, like fingers clasped together in worry or prayer. If the one who prays is an atheist, there is no celestial lift from the act. There is only today. Hope comes from watching the moon reflect on the snow, a roar of laughter in your AA meeting, leaning against the sun-warmed brick wall in the alley. Okay, so Mark, next slide, please. Um, and I believe this is a passage from um, your booklet, Catherine, is that right, from the, art, from the arts group? 
Um, and I love this. It's very, very plaintive message. Behind the mask, I am a behavioral health specialist working on a psychiatric unit during a global pandemic. Sometimes my job is rewarding beyond what I ever could imagine. Feeling the impact we have on our patients and witnessing the changes they can make is amazing. At the same time, that's the turning point. At the same time, I have left work countless times crying, dehydrated, bruised, bleeding, and covered in bodily fluids. So you'll see, like, these are good examples, I think, of how uh, the creative, these creative acts, these creative practices get you to the heart of what's really, really important. So I'm going to talk a little bit about data and demographics um, of what we've learned from the study so far. So 50% of the participants were nurses. Um, we had 10% that were doctors, um, other behavioral health specialists, social workers, and things like that. 92% uh, were female, 56% were single. Um, and they worked in healthcare for an average of 10 years. So these are experienced folks, which I think goes back to some of the things that Marx talked about is over time, um, the, the layering of the trauma gets heavier and heavier. So they had high baseline symptoms of anxiety, depression, and PTSD, also high baseline levels of burnout. Um, and they were said, most of them said that they were very likely to leave their job um, soon. So um, this is actually kind of really wonderful to see. These, these individuals were very, very busy and yet they attended on average um, nine and a half of the 12 sessions, um, which I think is absolutely wonderful. Um, only a quarter attended less than eight. And overall, the satisfaction scale was up to 32, was the highest, from zero to 32. Um, and so the overall program had an average of 31 out of possible 32 which um, I think is absolutely wonderful. So when compared to the control group, the intervention significantly improved symptoms of anxiety, depression, PTSD, feelings of burnout, and the likelihood of leaving their jobs. Um, we have specific numbers, which um, we decided not to sort of belabor, um, but the, what I am told, I look at the numbers and I don't necessarily understand them. I think Mark does um, and Catherine and the others do as well, much better than I do, but the, the there were significant improvements in all of these scales. So here's what Nina, a uh, behavioral health specialist um, and participant had to say. I've continually surprised myself with my ability to step up to the plate, but being the holder of someone else's pain and trauma is never easy and always weighs on you. Something I've taken away from our art group is that this is a shared sentiment among the healthcare workers, and yet we never back down. We continue to show up day in and day out for our patients and for our coworkers. We find ways to build resilience and lean on one another. We step up to the plate in hard or scary situations, and that makes us brave. Throughout this group experience and my reflections on the past year working in healthcare during a pandemic, I've been reminded that despite everything, hope and courage still persist. It's a wonderfully positive statement, I think, after the intervention. So next slide, please. So there are some limitations and Mark um, and uh, the other um, instructors, please jump in here. Um, I don't know what the not an intention control is, but Mark can maybe address that. Um, but one thing I do know from this is that um, uh, Mark has talked a lot about the idea of the need for an objective outcome, which would actually even strengthen the data even more. And the objective outcome could be something like um, after this inter intervention, um, individuals leaving the hospital or the hospital setting re was reduced by X percent, um, which could really sort of, that's a very clear sign of, of how the intervention has been working. Next, Mark, please. So in terms of uh, future directions, the, um, the study has been approved for a second cycle by the NEA, which is really, really wonderful. So some of the things that we're working on now is to make sure we have longer term follow up at four, eight and 12 months for individuals who have participated in the program to see how long the positive effects last. Um, also qualitative studies to determine how to better implement the, the CAP program. Um, and then do a second uh, pilot study with not just um, healthcare professionals like doctors and nurses and therapists, but um, anybody who works in the hospital. So that could be environmental services, transport personnel and food services people. 
um, to really expand the scope of what we're doing. Um, and then the idea would be to do a multi-center stage stepped wedge design for healthcare professionals. So across you know, the state or even nationally, like in multiple kinds of centers to measure the impact um, of these kinds of sessions. And so this is just a final uh, message of you know, what a good day looks like. Um, and I believe this is from your cohort also, Catherine, is that correct? So I guess now, um, do we wanna move on to questions? Yeah, yeah questions. questions, awesome. So thank you for putting those in there. We have a question from Darcy Copeland. Do participants get to pick their group or are they assigned? Do you think it matters? I'll, I'll, I'll take that. Can you hear me, Kristen? Yep. So what people got to do is rank order what they wanted to do. Um, and then they got randomized to the group they got into that was the highest ranked group. Um, we didn't want people to do things they didn't want to do, but what's interesting is some people didn't get their first choice. Most people got their first or second choice, and people realized that even though it wasn't their preferred modality, um, it, was, it was effective also. So we didn't want to force people to do something, but when they got into a different group, I, I think it was effective also. Awesome, we have a question from Brian. What was the overall quality of participation from MDs in relation to other medical professionals in the trial as a whole? I can speak to that a little bit. I feel like I had, <clears throat> if there's only 10%, I had a lot, I had like three or four. Um, I thought it was good. Uh, I, I think that the MDs who signed up uh, for it, uh, you know, I don't, were were open. They were, uh, I can say personally, it was fun to be a psychotherapist and to be conveying um, some just emotional skills to MDs who are like, you know, frontline uh, emergency room folks. So uh, I found them to be very humble and very open to it. And then let other people answer too, but my experience was very positive. I, I could answer, I had a few doctors as well. And what I found is that our docs almost uh, exclusively, but everyone had a flavor of this, seemed the farthest um, separated from their own creative self. And it took, to, it, like they would say, I really, I haven't picked up a paintbrush since kindergarten. Um, and so it was really interesting to see that separation and, and kind of the relief it felt to be able to express. I think medical school doesn't necessarily in, uh, encourage creativity, but I never went. So I'd have to defer that question to Mark. Sounds good. Um, we have a question from Elaine. How will you test whether or not ongoing participation at some level is critical to ongoing positive impact? Yeah, so that's why we're doing the four, eight and 12 month follow-ups to see the longevity of the effect. In, in general, most things need booster effects in terms of behavioral interventions. So I would assume we would need that, but we can actually see when to do that. We've also done qualitative interviews with some of the participants after the study was over and a lot of them want to continue it on. So I think it's, it's going to be necessary. Um, and I think we, we can figure that out. Awesome. We have a question from Nicole asking, why do you think there is such a low rate of male participants and how could that be increased? Um, I, I think part of it is that um, most of the participants were nurses and in general, most nurses uh, are, are, are women. Um, so I think that's part of it. I think there could also be some uh, social norms where men feel that this is a little too touchy-feely for them um, and didn't want to participate and probably something we need to, to figure out how to overcome and maybe promote and market better. Awesome. We have a question from Nancy asking, is the resi resiliency lab unique to CU Anschutz and slash or are other hospitals and centers doing similar programs? Do you want me to answer that one? Sure. Um, yeah, this is unique to what we're doing. I mean, there are a few places around the country that are doing somewhat similar things, but um, I mean, Hopkins has a group, and but they, the, the difference is a lot of the other groups focused on 
patients and patients' families. I think we're one of the own groups that are doing this type of work um, for, for the healthcare professionals. Um, and hopefully the, what the research lab is supposed to be is does we serve as a resource to the region or the country. Um, and that's why, as Tony said, we, we produce these protocols. We hope to teach other people how to do this. And just from the sort of arts organization perspective, um, most of this work is a research space, but there are lots of other arts organizations who are doing this kind of work, you know, exploring what kind of impact arts enrichment can have on at-risk communities. So whether it's the Denver Art Museum or um, lot, lots of different organizations are doing it, they're just not necessarily related to a research project. Um, another question from Nicole, how many individual sessions were there and where were the sessions? Um, there were 12 sessions. They were an hour and a half long or 90 minutes once a week. And they were held off campus outside the hospital. I felt that that was important at the Lighthouse Writers Workshop building. Um, so I think it was good to get people removed from the work environment. It was also centrally located in Denver. So people from different hospitals could meet in a central location. Awesome. This is a question for facilitators. How do you help new participants feel comfortable if they've never done creative arts before? Like Catherine said, if they haven't picked up a paintbrush since elementary school or something like that. I, I would love to answer that question. I'd also love to hear Hillary's answer because her modality, I think specifically offers that chance. But I think it, um, we really do emphasize that anyone who can um, use a pen, pencil, their body, or pick up a musical instrument can benefit from these workshops. And so no skill or talent is required. Um, and we emphasize that from day one in a, in a very specific and explicit way. But I would pass that to Hillary next. Mm, thanks, Catherine. It's a great question. Um, in my group, we literally start on the ground. <laughs> We just uh, get on the floor and then there's so much, um, I, I used some writing and I even used some drawing to help scaffold that experience of even just going into a personal reflection before you ever even get to the stage of putting it in motion, um, especially when there's other people witnessing you. It's, it's so vulnerable to, to move your body um, in an open space. So a lot of scaffolding, literally starting with the ground and getting that physical support and starting first to build those relationships before we actually started to move together. That's how it worked in the uh, dance movement group. I'd like to jump in too, just to say in general, this, this whole, uh, this is always an issue for all of us creative arts therapists is this, uh, oh, I can't do that or I'm not creative is just such a common uh, litany that we hear from people. And uh, I think a lot of that is, is the normalizing that, that, you, that these guys are talking about. And a, and a lot of it too, is that what we're trying to get to is, is being able to handle that kind of vulnerability. And that's really, I mean, it's so, it's so, that very resistance is exactly the thing that we want in a way, because that is your capacity to be vulnerable. And, and so, we, so there's just a lot of normalizing that if you're gonna say a thing, do a thing, it's a creative act and, and let's go. Um, so that's, but, and it's also done within that very kind and accepting kind of format. I agree. And I think, you know, for the writing piece of it is encouraging them to turn that self-censor off. And so, you know, like, like I talked about those rules for free writing. Um, we also say you don't have to share your writing ever if you don't want to. Um, typically what happens is people hear other people's stories and they are like, oh, I wrote something very, very similar. And then they get excited and then they start sharing. Um, you know, which sometimes takes time, but I think the idea of just lowering the expectations as much as possible is important. Great. Well, we will wrap it up there. A recording of this presentation will be available on our website uh, early next week, but it looks like there was a lot of Q&A. So if you want to continue the conversation, feel free to reach out. My email was on the RSVP for this Zoom link. So if you have any questions, definitely feel free to reach out. And thank you so much for attending. We really appreciate it.